Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome to another ChrisMartinson.com podcast. I am your host, of course, Chris Martinson. The issue before us as investors are as daunting today as they can possibly be. And my position has been that today we're all speculators, not investors, because we've been placed in the uncomfortable position of trying to guess what the central banks are going to do next. Also weighing on investors today is the fact that our official data is what I call fuzzy. That is, it's often statistically massaged to make things look a little bit rosier than they otherwise might. To help us sort through both of these investment challenges is Charles Biederman, founder, chief executive officer of Trim Tabs Investment Research, an independent investment research firm based in Sausalito, California. He is routinely interviewed on all the big financial media and is someone I follow quite closely because his approach is to follow the base data and let that tell the story. Founded in 1990, Trim Tabs Investment Research is the leading independent institutional research firm focused on the supply and demand of shares and stock and money available for investment. That base data, I really want to get to that today. Uh, welcome, Charles. It's a real pleasure to have you as a guest today. Well, good to be with you. Thanks. Uh, hey, let's begin with your background so that people can appreciate first the depth of your knowledge and experience, and then why it is that you follow the fundamental data sources that you do. You, you mean you want me to fess up that I'm really very old? <laughs> if that's how you want to approach it, sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, my first uh, uh, my first job after uh, graduating Harvard Business School uh, was not what everybody does. I became Alan Abelson's assistant at Barron's Financial Weekly, hmm. and so it was a terrific postgraduate education in how the markets really work. And uh, from there. I ended up having to uh, become an entrepreneur because Harvard wanted me to repay my student loans at the time, which you they couldn't did. do on a journalist's salary. So I actually uh, had been predicting a collapse in the REITs market in the early 1970s, so all the money had gone in, and then huge amount of construction and interest rates in 1973 went from 7% to 20% as the energy, uh, the first energy price shock hit. And oil prices went from three dollars a barrel to thirty, and so um, I participated in the collapse of the real estate market. Then bought bunches of properties, six shopping centers, a thousand apartments, two office buildings out of foreclosure in the South. Uh, when I was in my late twenties, uh, moved back to New York. Uh, whatever ended up going broke in '87. When the real estate market, in, I reinvested, sold most of the stuff in the South, reinvested in Jersey. And when the REITs and the banks collapsed, or the SNLs collapsed, I mean, in uh, 87, uh, my banks went under. I had a positive net worth, but I was forced to declare bankruptcy. And I realized that price is a function of liquidity having nothing to do with value. Uh, if I wasn't foreclosed on, I could have sold my properties for a nice profit, but... My banks went under, and the banks were, uh, and all the loans were called. So, using that background, I decided to look at the markets based on supply and demand, and realized no one had ever been looking at the stock market in terms of all there is in the market is shares of stock, and there's money available to buy those shares. And so that's what we've been tracking ever since. Well, I like that idea a lot that price is a function of liquidity, not fundamental value. So I, let's move now to some of that data and what it's telling us, and uh, that might be different from what both, I guess, two things I want to track today if we have the time. One is our, how our, unof, our official unemployment numbers maybe are tracking differently from the base tax data, but, but for now, I'd like to start with what stocks are signaling. Hey, they're just 10% away from their all-time highs. Uh, we're looking at that. Is this truth or fiction? Well, it's, it's um, if the Fed... And the other globe central banks hadn't created or ten trillion dollars of paper money uh, in the last since '09, uh, we wouldn't be talking about a stock market ten uh, percent below the all-time high. Since last October, uh, last six months, uh, the, the value of all stocks is up like four, almost four trillion dollars, hmm. and. Since last October, the increase in take-home pay for everybody who pays taxes on a job is up 
maybe two hundred billion at a two hundred billion annual rate of increase. Three, you know, so we're talking about a uh, uh, a huge increase in wealth only for people who own stocks. And why did that happen? Well, the Fed pumped huge amounts of money into the economy. Companies ended up with a huge amount of cash on their balance sheet. And starting in August, they've been spending huge amounts of money, a billion eight a day net of all new share sales, buying back their own shares. In other words, they're reducing the number of shares out there, giving shareholders cash for their holdings. And so shareholders, 80% of the Russell 1000, the largest companies, are held by institutions. And those institutions typically have a, a, a same, you know, uh, 3% cash. So if someone buys back their shares, they have to replace those shares. So there's more money chasing fewer shares. So, if, you know, supply and demand, more money chasing fewer shares, the price of the remaining shares should go up. So the the many of these companies have been tapping uh, the capital markets as well for debt. Uh, have been uh, you know obviously generational interest rate lows. So they've had access to this liquidity, which is coming through the Fed. Um, what did you say? A billion eight a day. A billion eight a day since August. Wow. Where's the retail investor been in this story? Taking their money out and, and spending it probably on living. And and what? How do those Paying money dollars. flows track? How do they compare? Well, we see now flows from U.S. equity mutual funds. I was just talking uh, before we spoke with Bob Bizzani from CNBC, him wanting to know when are individuals coming back. And I said, well, they came back in the first quarter of last year and then got slammed as the market sold off in April. This year, the mark last year the market was up over ten percent the first four months and then got slammed. This year, the market's up over ten percent, and individuals are saying, "Hey, I re- I've seen this st- movie already. I don't want to. This uh, sequel doesn't isn't appealing to them." Well, in the work I do, I get to interact with a lot of people who uh, are investors, and they've, there's a, a fundamental lack of faith out there. There's actually more than that. There's fear. There's concern that the markets are rigged in some important ways, that there's asymmetry of information, that the computerized bots, whatever it is that's going on out there, maybe that the regulators are not really um, watching out for everybody with equal interest. Whatever the source of fear is, I, I know a lot of people have lost faith in the markets, but not the institutions apparently and not the, not the companies who are buying back shares, huh? Well, the market's rigged. I mean, uh, in January of 10, I went on, uh, I said on CNBC and on Bloomberg, that the mark, there's no money coming into stocks, and yet the stock market keeps going up. The law of supply and demand still exists, and for stock prices to go up, there has to be more money buying those shares. Mm-hmm. There's no other way in aggregate that that could happen. Uh, so and I said it had to be coming from the government, and everybody thought I was a lunatic, uh, a conspiracy theorist, whatever. And then, lo and behold, in October of 2011, Mr. Bernanke says officially that the purpose of QE1 and QE2 is to raise asset prices. Mm-hmm. And if I remember correctly, equities are an asset, uh, and bonds are an asset. So asset prices have gone up as the Fed has been manipulating the market, at the same time as the economy is not growing or not growing very fast or growing roughly at the rate of inflation, and I'm talking about wages and salaries, I totally ignore GDP because it's a ridiculous number if anybody looked at it, and the only reason everybody uses it is because everybody doesn't understand what they're talking about, Mm -hmm. and no one wants to do the work to understand that GDP is a useless indicator. So we look at at wages and salaries, real-time income, to me, is the best indicator of income. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a, what a what a preposterous notion. But but since we're there, what are wages and salaries telling us right now? Uh, the, it went out at it went out. I'm sorry. Wages and salaries are growing at between a half, you know, under one percent faster than inflation. Uh, wages and salaries in our most recent data, like three and a half percent. 3.7 in that range, uh, and inflation is, you know, whatever, 293, pick a number. So if nominal wages and salaries for everybody who, who has a, a withholding, is who has income taxes and employment taxes withheld from their paychecks, which is all 132 million people 
uh, on the payroll included in the payroll survey by the VLS, an emphasis on the word survey, uh, that wages and salaries are barely growing. Uh, in in reality, uh, we're about at six point three trillion after tax income for everybody. Well, that's up from five point nine trillion at the annual rate at the early 2009 low, it's still well below the $7.1 trillion peak. In 07, $7.1 trillion take-home pay for everybody who pays taxes. And the gap between the two right now is, is still uh, capital gains have disappeared as the real estate market disappeared. And, you know, the Bureau of Economic Analysis does not include capital gains in their income data because... Well, it's only dirty capitalists who have capital gains, I guess. I don't know. Mm -hmm. All right. So in this... I don't know why they don't include it. <laughs> All right. Well, we don't, we don't include the increase in debt when uh, subtract that off of our GDP. So uh, I don't know. Maybe we just ignore very big things sometimes. Well, they go use that bogey again. Yeah. GDP. I know. With a fourth quarter deflator at 0.8%, I was, that's, that's all I need to know about that number. Um, it's uh, obviously uh, very far off of my personal experience, but also uh, what I think a lot of uh, very solid inf inflation data is coming to us through the companies that actually have to buy things and report their cost of goods sold. Um, it's, uh, we're seeing some extraordinary inflation, especially on the commodity exposed companies out there. Uh, you know, double digit, 10, 11% kind of stuff. It's amazing. Well, yeah, well, you know, if you think about it, the dollar. Uh Dollars being debased by the printing of a, a hundred, you know, the U.S. government is spending three hundred billion a month on everything it pays bills, salaries. It collects two hundred billion a month in taxes and everything else, and it borrows a hundred billion a month. Yeah. And but it doesn't really borrow a hundred billion a month because a hundred billion is added to the debt. It prints a hundred billion and calls that debt. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I'd like to be able to run my business by printing money to pay my bills, a third of them. That would be good. <laughs> I would, too. I would, too. So uh, in, in their collection, you mentioned the $200 billion a month that is coming in. Talk to me very quickly, if you could, talk to us about the tax receipts and uh, what those are signaling. And ca can we compare those to the unemployment figures that have been re released and reported? <clears throat> well, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, and the Department of Census use 1960 technology surveys and com of the present compared to hard data from the past. The same way they've done this for 40 years to determine uh, income, sales, consumer discretionary spending, the savings rate, all those numbers. Are, are are fudgy at best, you to use your phrase, uh, c since they ignore real time data. Like they do, the Bureau of Labor Statistics does a survey of four hundred thousand employers, of which say seventy percent, only seventy percent is backed by the time they report uh, the number of jobs for the month, and. They true that survey to hard data that comes from state quarterly unemployment insurance pay collections, which is a quarterly number that get, gets to the BLS the soonest is five months at the uh, from the end of, the, of of a certain quarter. Five months later, the uh, BLS gets the valid number, and then it benchmarks the past to that data. So, in other words, the real numbers that they use is just a survey, and it can get you know, 50 to 100 percent modified, uh, with it, you know, a year, nine months, a year later, and nobody even realizes or even, you know, th those numbers are pretty much ignored, but everybody focuses on their initial guesstimate, which even they say is not meant to be considered a real number. Nevertheless, the Wall Street Journal says, up oh, 200,000 jobs have been created. Like, that's the truth. Mm -hmm. And not even that it's a seasonally adjusted number, which is another chance for mischief. Because to do seasonal adjustments, you have to get, you know, why don't you use year-over-year -year numbers and forget seasonal adjustments? And why don't you use, and so, to, I'm sorry, I'm going all over the place, but to go back to the wages and salaries we track, when, you, when anybody who's on a job that gets a W-2 
when the amount of income and employment taxes are withheld from our paychecks, it gets wired to the Treasury and by from our banks. And when that money gets wired to the Treasury, they report how much they collected. And so we track that data. It's reported in the Daily Treasury Statement with a lot of other daily Treasury activities. However, embedded in that income and employment tax collection package is how many people were working, what was gross pay, what was take-home pay. Mm-hmm. And by geogra- by zip code, so you have, and by uh, industry classification, so you have this huge amount of real time data on what's really going on in the economy, available but ignored. And when I've been, you know, for six years, I've been saying, "Why do you ignore this?" And their answer pretty much is, "Mind your own business. We don't care what you think." And this is the way we've been doing it. And we like our paychecks. Thank you very much. <laughs> so uh, this data, though, I, I love the idea of, of real-time data. Are there flaws in this? Uh, what are the wrinkles in this data set? Or are you these the wrinkles? BL- well, there's a lot. It's, it's a survey. And no, no, not the-, not the BLS one, but in the, in the daily treasury statement, the, the W-2 flows. Um, well, it has to be. It, the, the, we only get what the actual no- amount withheld. <clears throat> there's... Three reasons why the amount withheld year over year would change. One is that the people with jobs got made more money, so the amount of withholding goes up. Two, mm-hmm. the people with jobs might have changed bracket because they made more money, and so they ha- they're at a higher bracket. That we, that's called bracket creep. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, three people, there might be more employees mm-hmm. or less employees as people get hired and fired. So each month, on average, 4 million people enter and leave the job market. Right. In other words, on average, 4 people are fired, 4 million people are fired, 4 million people are hired. And then in January and February, there are huge seasonal adjustments because of the weather. <clears throat> and so based upon, like, a million seven seasonal adjustment ads, in other words, there's the according to the, the geniuses at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, they add a million seven phantom jobs to those people working in February to, balance, you know, to make it like a level number with the rest of the year. And why a million seven? Well, based on the past, that's our best guess. And the fact that the weather was so great this winter, that doesn't, you know, they'll factor that in next year when the numbers will be worse, because, whatever. Mm-hmm. So Does that on the make one, sense what I'm saying? Absolutely. So on the one hand, we have this survey, which is seasonally adjusted on top of that. And on the other hand, we have this, this base data, which might change for a number of reasons. Uh, bracket creep, uh, people might actually be earning more uh, in that case, or hiring, firing, things like that. But, but generally speaking, we have these two things that we can compare. One is a survey that's adjusted, and the other is this uh, W-2 income flow statement stuff that comes through the, through the daily treasury statement. What is that data telling us right now? that the economy is, is limping along. It's barely growing. And if it wasn't for levitating equity and very low bond prices, it probably would be even slower than it is. So in reality, all it looks to me what this five trillion, uh, $100 billion creation of new money a month has been creating $200 billion a year increase in take home pay. Now isn't that weird? A hundred billion it takes a hundred billion months of newly created paper to boost take home pay by you know, or a trillion the deficit this year is going to be a trillion three, I think, mm-hmm. is the current estimate. And it, it takes a trillion three of newly created money to boost take home pay by two hundred billion? What's wrong with this? <laughs> There's some sort of a hole in the boat, I guess. <laughs> you know, and if they stop uh, uh, the deficits or and then now they want to increase taxes next year by about two hundred billion to plug the deficit. So wait a second. So incomes are up by two hundred billion, and these smart people want to reduce incomes by two hundred billion to raise taxes. And the stock market is within ten percent of all time highs. There's logic there, isn't there? <laughs> well, so this this creates that growing sense of anxiety in in the investor class because obviously there there is something that just doesn't quite add up here. Um, and and just to, to switch, open our view up just a tiny bit, uh, jump across the pond for a second, is Europe fixed? Uh, <laughs> well, if, if by fixed you mean guaranteed to go down the toilet, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> yeah, Europe is, uh, 
the problem, I mean, in Greece, uh, the numbers I've read, uh, doing some Google, is that of the 11, a little over 11 million Greeks still left who haven't <laughs> emigrated, uh-huh. uh, close to 3 million are retired, and half of everybody else works for the government. And, of course, uh, with the austerity, they're talking about slashing pensions and, uh, yeah, and, and, and squeezing and, government uh, sa- salaries and pay. And in Spain pay. and uh, uh, Portugal, half the teenage, half the people under 25, apparently, are unemployed. And uh, what does that say for the future stability of that region? <laughs> well, a generation lost? I don't know if that's a good thing or not. You know, my... my well, my prescription on all of this years ago was that we suffered from something I can summarize in three words, which was too much debt. And uh, this is a decades-long phenomenon that, that's well, been no, building. Well, I don't think it's really too much debt. I think it's the fundamental belief that government can be effective at providing cradle-to-grave or even any services for its people. And all, even at that, it's, name me one activity that government has ever been cost effective at providing one service i mean the post office uh you know fighting a war national I highway mean, look system at the horrible look at these horrible tragedies thousands hundreds of thousands of people are being killed because this government thinks it knows how to fight wars mm-hmm. well no, so when i say too much debt what i mean is well i do think in aggregate it was too high but i was watching um our economy, both at the at the private and the um, public levels, increasing its its debt loads at a faster rate than nominal GDP growth. If we wanted to use that bogey right there, but but however we track national income, we were increasing our debts faster than our income was increasing, and that's a math problem. Sooner or later, that thing runs out of steam. And it wasn't just the U.S. It turns out a lot of Europe was doing that, and Japan was a poster child for that. And and it seems to be a phenomenon that's that's quite easy to fall into at the national, even global well, level. I, I don't disagree with, with, with the facts as you state them, but if you go back to why, if you go back to, like, starting in 82, when the IBM PC or the personal computer first showed up, through 07, you had a, a period of very rapid economic growth globally. Incomes grew very rapidly. Uh, you know, you had PC, the Internet, broadband, all that stuff. So when incomes grow rapidly... People take on more debt because, oh, look, my income's going up. I can borrow more. So you take on more debt, and then all of a sudden, incomes crash, and you've taken on all this debt because you kept, we kept assuming that our incomes would grow so we could handle the debt service. But the problem with assuming incomes are going to keep growing, if they stop growing, you're broke. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, sooner or later, you're going to have a slowdown, right? That, that's yeah, just... and so that's my point. Is my point is it's not just income growth by itself, but it was income growth. I mean, debt growth supported by rapid income growth, but then the income growth disappeared. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so, so let, let's pretend I'm an investor, which I happen to be. What does an investor do in this market, particularly if they've kind of – I've lost faith in a number of dimensions. One, that our official data is telling me useful things that I can, that I can trust. And the second would be that, that the markets are – operating in a fundamentally fair way, meaning, you know where I lost it was when I watched the big banks turn in 100% win ratios off of their trading desks uh, for whole quarters. Uh, anything that has even the slightest bit of risk in it, you can't have a 100% win ratio in it. It's statistically off the charts. Unless the market's rigged. Unless the market's rigged. So I could go on. I have many other data points that, that suggest rigging is happening. So if we take that as an opening proposition that the Fed is, is basically saying, listen, we're going to do whatever it takes to get higher asset prices, should an investor just say, okay, I'm along for the ride and, and follow? Or how does somebody protect themselves against what seems to be a very, very risky proposition? If the Fed either succeeds or fail, it fails at this, and if they fail, it's easy to conjure up some fairly dark scenarios for uh, um, wealth destruction, I think. Well, we're going to be starting a retail uh, newsletter where we're going to uh, sell. I'm going to sell my ten bucks a week, nine ninety nine. What mm-hmm. Charles Biederman buying, selling, and thinking about the market. And so, if, if this were that, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and the preamble to all this is right now, well, you have a situation where, in reality. The economy is not growing very fast, but the government, but money is, paper money is. So, a third of my assets are in are in gold, and a small percentage of that in silver. 
but mostly gold. Mm -hmm. uh, and then given all that money printing has to end up in inflation at some point in time, I have about a third of my assets in uh, inflation-protected securities. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there's, since companies are shrinking the float, and grow, uh, we started a fund called Trim Tabs uh, Float Shrink ETF, traded on the New York Stock Exchange, ticker symbol TTFS, and it invests in the 100 companies that are shrinking the trading float the most grow, and growing free, so the, uh, growing free cash flow and not borrowing to buy. So the average company in our portfolio is growing free cash flow at 11% a year, using 65, uh, shrinking the trading float by 6.5%. On an annualized basis, and while maintaining a strong balance sheet, so uh, we believe that uh, the price of the share should go up by, you know, in my opinion, by six percent a year, even without the uh, more than the market, simply because those companies, the value of those companies, hasn't been diminished by the float shrink. If that makes any sense. It does. So yeah. that's that. Uh, that's I would dollar if I if you're a long term investor. And I think that we're three to five years from the market bottoming, but I would still recommend buying stock if you have a longer than a five-year time horizon on a monthly basis, and and that's the type of equity exposure I would want. I also own some Apple and some Salesforce.com. Apple, mm -hmm. because you know the, the social media trend is using everybody's using Apple, and Salesforce.com is the most effective cloud participant. Uh, and those are two big growth areas because I think the globe is going to continue to expand economically, but it's got this albatross of government-created messes around our necks. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think the I would have I still have even though I have a big loss I have a small position in shorting the big banks, shorting uh, uh, Europe, and shorting um, uh, the emerging markets, but totaling like 15% of my portfolio. So I'm a little bit leveraged, and the leverage is the short, which I'm losing money on, but it, I'm also making money on the other stuff. Right, so it's, that's your hedge in essence. Yeah, uh, I, I think at some point when companies stop buying back shares and, and start selling more than they're buying, the market's going to crack regardless of what the Fed does, or at least initially. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just want to have some shorts in the water just in case I want to increase my exposure. Okay. Big macro question then, um, because a, a, a big exogenous risk here is that it, it, the government, U.S. government has to fund uh, $1.3 a year. The Fed's been enabling that with their liquidity. Do you see anything out there that could force the hand of the Fed and the federal government, meaning is there any circumstance you can imagine coming in the next year where uh, the, the the vaunted bond market could rebel. But what I really mean is that foreign participation in our bond markets would dry up and there would be some set of pressures that would prevent the Fed from doing QE, 3, 4, 5, whatever is necessary. Is there anything you could see that could create that kind of a risk? Because I still note that roughly 10% of our current GDP is deficit spending by the by the federal government, maybe 8%, I guess, if I'm, if I'm being a little bit more accurate. But, you know, it's a pretty high number. Um, do you see any anything that could possibly upset that gravy train as a real risk? Um, yes, I think it will be up at some point. Uh, the, the world's going to recognize the emperor is naked. Uh, the only question is when. Will it be this year? I, I don't think it'll be. Too, I don't think it'll be before the election. I think there's too much vested interest in, in keeping things rosy and positive, uh, and I just don't see it happening soon. However, at some point. Hard money wins out over over phony money, and and uh, the the in investor class or the capital those with capital, uh, which right now seems to be the emerging markets, they're buying gold and, and bullion, and they're not buying dollars. Or China appears to have slowed their buying of dollars, even though China might be having their own growth problems or their own bad debt problems. But Singapore and all those other countries with huge cash flows, the emerging world. Uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised maybe by 213 or 214, a non-U.S. dollar alternative currency by those countries might, uh, uh, you know, something will happen. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a, a market that's fundamentally um, 
running on fumes or in this case liquidity, uh, which you call you know the funny money coming out. This is not a market my grandfather would recognize at all. And uh, uh, this is a totally unique market. We've never before had a market officially rigged and acknowledged as such. And what's amazing to me is when you watch CNBC or even Bloom- or Bloomberg TV, and these guys come on bullish. They look at PEs. Well, the PE for you know or. Well, what was the last? What was the PE the last time the market was rigged? <laughs> we don't know. And do what we? happens when the market is unrigged? Right. You know, there's no. This is we're in a strange, uncharted territory. You know, the last thing I want to say uh, that I think is very important for people to realize: in 1981, uh, before the market crossed to a thousand, the Dow crossed a thousand in 1980, early '82 and stayed above that, the, the value of all U.S. stocks was about $800 billion. And in October of '07, it peaked at 22 point something trillion. And it's back up to $19.4 trillion. Mm-hmm. So in 1981, there was maybe 100 hedge funds or less, I'm sure less, and maybe 100 a, a or so equity mutual funds and 3,000 stocks. Uh, of insti- you know institutional size of sorts back then. Now there's still 3,000 stocks, but there's 4,500 equity mutual funds, 10,000 hedge funds. The real wealth created since early, so in the last 30 years has been in the equity market, not in earnings. <laughs> I mean, earnings are up several times. Yeah, four or five times take-home pay is up, but the market's up 19, 20 times. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep, on the back of all those boomers entering their peak earning years and pushing all that money into equity markets was one. Yeah, so one yeah, as and we had technology breakthroughs. Mm-hmm. You know, the vow, the internet, uh, broadband, broadband. You know, more people in the last thirty years have uh, uh, gone from calorie insufficiency to calorie sufficiency as a percentage of the population than you know going back to the first time we industrialized in the 19th century. So it's like this huge increase in wealth and calories and uh, uh, all across the globe, all that money, went in, a lot of that money went into the real estate markets and went into the equity markets and boosted home prices and, and uh, stock prices dramatically, and now it's unwinding. All booms create excesses, and excesses are painful as the as the excesses from the boom are worked off and worked out and that's the process we're in and in the past it's taken 13 to 17 years to work off those excesses and we're still not even through year five well in the past i think we also allowed some of that creative destruction to happen and this time we're fighting that tooth and nail and uh... yeah well you can't fight that forever Right, can't fight that forever. So, um, in, as a final question, then I, I'm wondering. It feels like we're kind of, um, at least in, when it comes to deficit spending, and then also with the QE efforts and the central balance sheet expansion of the central banks, um, that uh, we're on a treadmill. I don't know how we get off of. So the question is, if the central banks were going to uh, get us back on a right path, what would they be doing that they aren't doing right now? Well, they would have cut. Mark to market early on, uh, yes, a lot of the uh, and kept reserve currency at a dollar, kept the, the uh, financial markets going, but let the big banks go bust. <clears throat> and then, and if the top five had gone under, then the next five would be now be the big banks, and the real estate market would have recovered. You got to mark to market the bad stuff. We've been reluctant, like Japan, which still hasn't marked to market from its 1990 debacle. We're, we're refusing to mark the market, so when you maintain phony levels, you restrict overall growth, and uh, you harm the overall economy, but you save the jobs of the big bankers and the politicians who created the messes. Mm-hmm. And so that's where we're at. We're benef- the only people benefiting are equity holders, uh, and it's temporary, as well as the big banks. And uh, at some point, Real, you know, gravity does work eventually. Even Wiley Coyote had to come back to Earth uh-huh. sooner or later. Well, if those of you who are old enough to remember that cartoon character, everybody knows Wiley Coyote. I hope, no matter how old they are, what you're saying then is that you think we're going to 
perpetuate the status quo until there's some sort of a forcing function, gravity yes. in this case of some kind. Yes. Right. Okay. Well, uh, this has been a very fascinating, insightful, and actually very pleasurable interview for me, and I'm hoping we can do it again sometime. How do people uh, follow your work and, in particular, find out about this new newsletter that sounds real intriguing? TrimTabs.com blog is our blog site. Mm -hmm. I do a video four or five days a week. Uh, no, three, four days a week, I mean, and there's other stuff on our blog site, including access to our ETF for more information, and uh, and we'll be posting information about the new uh, market letter uh, sometime in the next month. Well, fantastic. I'm looking forward to that personally, and uh, this has uh, been very interesting, and, and uh, I'm, I'm thankful that you look at the data the way you do and make it available to all of us. You're welcome. This concludes this podcast by Chris Martinson. To gain further insight into where things stand today and what might happen tomorrow, please visit chrismartinson.com. That's C-H-R-I-S-M-A-R-T-E-N-S-O-N.com. Please join Chris Martinson next time to continue your journey toward awareness, understanding, and action.